Hey, this is Tanner Sherlock. I'm the pastor at Shadow State Chi Alpha. And this is our podcast where our mission is to make disciples who then make disciples. Be sure and subscribe so you can get our content every time we post. And I pray that this message blesses you today. God bless. I just wanted to get on and share it with the podcast uh, this week since we didn't have our normal service. Um, you know, we, we normally have a uh, service on Tuesdays and this week we didn't, um, because our school was canceled. College was canceled. Um, because we got 10 inches of that, like real thick, wet, just sloppy, slushy snow. And, uh, so pretty much shut down the town for a day. Um, and so I didn't have anything recorded. And so I just wanted to get on and share with you guys a little bit and just kind of Make sure I'm posting something and give you guys something to listen to and chew on today. Um, something that's kind of been rolling around in my brain is that uh, the, the idea of being right isn't the end goal. As a Christian, being obedient is. And so, therefore, as a Christian, um, bringing someone to Christ isn't the end goal. Instead, being obedient to Jesus is. What does obedience to Christ look like for us? What should it look like for us as Christians? I'm guilty of loving to argue. Uh, all my friends know this. Uh, all my relatives know this. My wife knows this. I, I, I tend to enjoy arguing to a level that's not healthy at times. Um, it's just my personality. Uh, it's something I'm working on and been trying to grow in. And, and so when I say it's just my personality, I'm not using that as an excuse to say, Oh, I could just keep arguing because yeah, it's just part of my personality. Because I feel like in uh, today's society, something being a part of your personality has gotten to a place that's almost uh, idolatrous. It's, it's a extremely unhealthy. Um, Claiming that something is just part of your personality is a cop out for us in this world to just get out of things we don't want to do or things that we don't want to change or things that make us uncomfortable. If we make the excuse of, oh, it's just, I was born this way. This is how I am. Just if you don't like it, get out. No, that's not the way uh, as Christians that we should act. It is a part of my personality, but that's a problem. Because I don't want it to be a part of, part of my personality. Now, arguing and, and being um, capable of debating, debating and enjoying debating is not in and of itself idolatrous. But the level of which I tend to go with arguments is. Um, and so that's something I'm working on. And so I, I don't even remember where I heard this. But being right isn't the end goal. Being obedient is. I think that when I get into arguments, I'm always so concerned with being right, being the one that wins, being the, the correct person that I lose sight of even the goal of, of debate. I lose sight of the point of arguing because the point of arguing really, if we're going to express two different sides, two different opinions, two different standpoints, the goal really should ultimately be for me to learn from you and you to hopefully learn from me. You know, if I'm going to get into an argument, I want to teach you something. If it's something I know a lot about, um, I want to teach you what I know about it. And in the form of debate, I feel like we can learn a lot. Um, I remember in high school, um, debating, going on the debate team and deciding whether or not I wanted to join it. Um, one of the ways in which we test out whether or not you can be on the debate team is um, to actually purposely choose the side that you disagree with and try to argue from a standpoint that you don't agree with in order to, um, to, to see how good you are at debating something that you disagree with as well. And sometimes you end up, uh, disagreeing with it, but then by the end, you almost agree with your stance because you took the time to look at it. Now, that's not necessarily healthy. Um, you should be able to look at both sides without it affecting you know, your bias just because of your pride. And in high school, I was a little prideful. And so I, I actually recognized I probably shouldn't join the debate team because it tended to go a little too far and I'd get a little too heated. I didn't enjoy it at that level because of how frustrated it made me. Um, but I remember, uh, when I was a small group leader in college, um, our campus, our, our Chi Alpha, uh, pastor, our campus pastor. Um, his name was Sean. He's awesome guy. Um, he's, 
uh, now living in Arizona, but um, he came to us, all of us uh, small group leaders. I think there, at the time there was like 12 of us total. And uh, he brought up the idea of forgiveness. And he asked us what we really believed on forgiveness. Do we really think that we need to forgive everybody as Jesus, you know, as Jesus commands us to forgive everybody? Does that mean actually forgiving everybody? And he presented the idea that, you know, maybe this means more of forgive everybody, but really when those people, you know, that do really bad and sin against you, that we don't necessarily need to forgive them. And this sparked a massive debate and argument within the small group leadership meeting. And I'd say it lasted 45 minutes worth of us arguing. And by the end, because Sean's standpoint was that, um, that, uh, we don't have to forgive everybody. I took the opposite approach and because uh, from what I read from scripture, we have to forgive everybody. It's, it's, required of us to forgive everybody. It doesn't matter what they did to us. We have to forgive everybody because Jesus forgave us of even more, you know, that kind of thing. And Jesus took our, our sins against him on the cross. And we've talked about that in the last couple of weeks on this podcast, but, um, but, uh, and so me and the pastor were at opposites and he didn't talk to me ahead of time. This is just kind of how it naturally digressed. And then there were a couple people like my wife was one of them that stayed quiet, didn't really get into the argument, but listened and they had their own opinions, but, um, didn't want to jump into this argument. Then there was three or four of them that were arguing vehemently in agreement with, um, pastor Sean. And then there was me by myself. Uh, and then the, I would say the rest of everybody was arguing against me, but not, you know, vehemently, they would insert something every once in a while. But, uh, and so, um, there, there I was just arguing vehemently. I was getting frustrated because I was like, I'm, I'm, a, I was genuinely thinking like, I'm gonna have to quit this ministry. If this is what they truly believe, like, this is toxic. This is not scriptural. And if we're going to go off of away from what scripture has in order for us to, you know, choose not to forgive people, I think that's a pretty fundam fundamental belief. And uh, I was getting frustrated. I was, I mean, I was like, I, I gen just genuinely didn't understand how the pastor that I looked up to that was discipling me could disagree with me on something that was so fundamental in our Christian faith. And, uh, long story short, eh, not short. That was a pretty long explanation. It was like a seven minute explanation, but, um, and so we're arguing and, uh, you know, my standpoint, I go to the parable that Jesus taught about, um, the master that forgives the, um, his servant of what is equated to millions of dollars worth of debt. Um, and then that, servant turns around and chooses not to forgive his servant of a couple thousand dollars worth of debt. And then eventually the, the main master figures it out and then throws the servant in jail. Um, just like he threw his servant in jail and basically says, I forgave you and you already forgot what I forgave you for. And so the whole reason Jesus tells that parable is to, uh, let us know that, you know, we should forgive because he forgave us of even more. And so whatever anybody does on this earth, we should forgive them for. And the basic principles, and I've gotten into forgiveness quite a bit because I think it's important for us, um, to know that forgiveness isn't for you. You know, I'm not, if, if you, if you beat me up and stole my wallet, I'm not forgiving you for your sake. Um, I'm forgiving you for my sake because it's something that I don't, I shouldn't give you more control over my life than you deserve. And me choosing to hold on to that hatred or anger, um, causes me to not be able to get over it. It causes you to actually affect me more than you deserve. And so forgiving you is for me. It's, it's for me to forgive you because if you deserved it, it would be called reconciliation, not forgiveness. The whole premise of what forgiveness is, the definition of forgiveness is really forgiving somebody for something that they don't deserve. And to the level of which they don't deserve it is semi irrelevant because little or big 
people don't deserve forgiveness. They don't earn forgiveness. I mean, we could let them earn forgiveness if they apologize or something like that. But if they do that, then again, it goes back into that's reconciliation, not forgiveness. If I forgive you of your debt, it isn't because you repaid your debt because then that's not forgiveness. You know, if I take out a loan and the bank forgives me of my, my debt, it's not because I paid them back for it because then I would have reconciled my debt and I would have paid off my debt. Um, it's totally different. And so forgiveness is forgiveness, um, of those debts is, is entire. It's not based upon what you do for me. And so a lot of us view forgiveness as though it's that way that it's what, what can you do for me in order for me to forgive you of what you've done to me? I need you to apologize. I need you to know what you did wrong so that you can feel bad about it, but that's reconciliation. That's not forgiveness. And so, um, that's kind of my viewpoint of it. Like I said, Sean was kind of bringing the viewpoint of like, well, if they do something truly heinous, you don't really have to forgive them of it. So, yeah. So this argument went on and it went on and it went on. And, uh, eventually, um, uh, Mike, the, one of the volunteer staff for Chi Alpha, he steps in and he says, you know, honestly, I, I think I agree with Tanner on this. Um, I, I haven't really spoke up. I just kind of wanted to see how the argument on, unveiled and, uh, or unfolded, not unveiled how the argument unfolded. Uh, and, uh, I just want to step in and say that I actually agree with Tanner on this. And then I think like one or two more students then at that point voiced up that they agreed with me. However, there was the bulk of the 10 and the, the director of, of the ministry, um, pastor Sean, that were still vehemently disagreeing with me. And, uh, so we go on arguing and it's, and it's, it's getting ugly. I'm getting to the point where, cause it's, I'm desperate. You know, I'm like, I, I need you guys to, to agree with me on this because this is a, this is a, a non-negotiable for me. This is something that I can't, I can't just reconcile. You know, I, 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 I can't be a part of a ministry that believes this. And, um, uh, so we end up finishing the argument and, um, at the very end of the argument, Pastor Sean says, so, uh, everybody who was agreeing with me and was on my side of things, I just want you to know that you are wrong. You do need to forgive everybody. And he goes through and he explains the scriptural references and he explains, um, why we need to forgive everybody no matter what. And then he basically stopped it off with, or topped it off with, uh, um, this is why you can't just agree with your pastor you have to read the scripture for yourself. And, and he's like, Tanner, I want to give you a uh, big thanks for holding firm in your beliefs. Um, even at the risk of disagreeing with your pastor, um, you know, your mentor, because, um, just because you, you knew the scripture, you knew what it said. And because you knew what it said, you can actually then make a calculated decision on what, um, what you believe and what the, the scripture says you believe. Um, those guys that were arguing against Tanner and on my side of things, you are wrong. And, uh, and unfortunately this is a great example of how you can't just follow what other people say. You have to read the Bible for yourself in order to truly understand it. And I think it was such an, and I loved that point. And I've, I've thought about replicating it again within, you know, that I'm a pastor within the students who are in my ministry. However, I don't know if it would go over quite that well because, um, you know, from the very beginning, I, I encourage our students to, um, make sure that they know the scripture for themselves. Don't just take my word for things. And, and so I don't know if they would, um, argue, you know, on my side of things, I think they would almost purposely choose the opposite side <laughs> because they know that I like to argue. Um, but it was such a great point and it, it, it did challenge the way that I believed about, um, authority and, and to what level we need to have authority within scriptural authority versus, you know, what, what the world, the authority looks like. And, and, uh, you know, scripture is very clear that if your authority goes against scripture, that you don't have to obey your authority in that. Um, but ultimately the, the question comes down to how can I know what I need to be doing and not doing if I don't read the Bible for myself, if I don't know what it says? Um, because in that instant, if I had not known what the Bible said on forgiveness and let's say that the pastor was legit and what he was teaching, I would have left there and 
felt like I was good. I didn't need to forgive people. And that could have caused a lot of harm in me because those years right there, those following years, those few years following that were very formative in me being able to work through some of the, the past traumas that I've been through some of the past, um, you know, abuses that I've been through. And, uh, I think that has been very important for me as a pastor now, as well as, as a father and as a husband and, you know, you name it just as a person, as a human being, um, those next years were very formative. And so had he been legit and had I not known what scripture said, you know, I'd have been walking around and been like, no, I don't need to forgive you. You're a jerk. You don't deserve it. And it would have really hurt me because I, I am a better person because I've been able to forgive some of those people and, and I'm able to walk through some, and there's still some things I'm walking through forgiveness wise. I'm not pretending like I've forgiven everybody and I'm good. Like I, I'm still working through some things, not gonna lie. Um, I, you know, there seems like every month or so I come up with something else that I need to walk through forgiveness on. And so, um, So knowing scripture is extremely important. And so coming back to it, you know, kind of what I've started out this with, um, being right isn't the goal, being obedient is. How, how should that sentence, how should that thought process challenge the way that we have conversations with people, you know, when we get into the, uh, you know, there's different people who are coming against Christian faith right now. And we'll just leave it at that. If, if you're listening to this, you, you know what I'm talking about. There's people who are coming against Christian faith and, uh, and having conversations with those people is, is important. It is extremely important. Um, however, in having those conversations with those people being right, isn't the goal. Now the truth is important. Now that's, we're not talking about truth. Truth is extremely important and the truth needs to be, you know, withheld to, but being obedient in those conversations is more important than being right. And so this kind of goes back to something else I teach a lot of is that the truth is important, but it has to be coupled with love because brutal truth hurts. It harms, it causes destruction. However, truth in love can heal. It can bring um, people to Christ. It can show people the truth um, in a way that they can receive it. Uh, the truth and brutality, it's, they're both still truth. If, if I'm blunt and brutal, in telling the truth versus loving my neighbor and telling the truth in love. Those are two totally different things. And I can tell you that telling somebody that they're wrong about something as a passive aggressive post on Facebook is not the truth in love. I mean, it's flat. It's just not blasting on somebody about what they've done wrong on social media without having a conversation with them is not the truth in love. It's still true though. Being right. Isn't the end goal being obedient is. And so in having those conversations, ultimately we want to point point people to Jesus, right? So pointing people to Jesus comes back to bringing them to Christ. Isn't the end goal being obedient is. We still want to point them to Jesus, but we want to point them to Jesus through obedience of what Christ is asking us to do and pointing us to do and directing us to do. Not because we want to put some accolade and be like, I brought 55 people to Jesus this year. I earned some sort of badge. Like that's not, that's stupid. Like, come on, that's dumb. But I do see some pastors who boast those numbers like, oh, I have brought this amount of people to Jesus. I have brought this. In. And that's not, I'm sorry, because the person who was obedient and brought three people to Jesus was just as obedient as the pastor who was obedient and brought 5,000 people to Jesus. If they were both just as obedient as each other, then both of them are at the same level in their relationship with Jesus, you know? Because it's more about the obedience to Christ than it is 
the accolades that go with it. But anyway, and so, um, you know, this comes down to what is being obedient to Christ look like? I mean, first we have to recognize that we're sinners, that everybody in this world is sin. They've fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 3, 23 says that, that no one was righteous before God. Romans 3 says that, uh, 10 through 18, um, there is no righteous deeds of those of us, you know, on earth. We, we, we are not good. It is Christ in us that is good. Um, second thing is to know that you're not alone in this. You know, we've got God, we've got Jesus, we've got the Holy Spirit, um, walking alongside us and teaching us and growing us. We're not alone. Um, third thing is, uh, having faith in Jesus that he's going to, you know, ultimately he, he wants to bring everything to both his good and ours. And sometimes that's hard to see. Um, I was watching a video today. Uh, gosh, I wish I would document where I watch these videos at, but uh, who was writing or who was speaking. But, um, but, uh, I was watching this video is basically saying that like as kids, as children, you know, there's some things that we perceive completely wrong even though our parents were telling us it in truth, but our understanding of the world was so limited that we didn't really actually grasp what the truth was. Um, you know, for me, my brother, my brother told me when I was little that, uh, if I ate the seeds of an apple, that a tree would grow out of my stomach. Well, he was 10 years older than me. He was an adult in my mind, in my eyes. And so I, I just took it as blind truth. I was like, Oh yeah, that's, that's real. Definitely. And I went on believing that to the point where I argue with my teacher and got into like detention because I was vehemently arguing with my teacher that if I ate an apple seed, a tree would grow out of my stomach. And it was truth for me. It was 100% truth for me. And, uh, the way I saw the world wasn't through eyes of truth. It was through what my brother had told me in the trust that I built with him. Um, some of the examples he gave were like, you know, if your parent says that, um, you know, I think one person said, my parents told me when I was little that, uh, that babies come from adult things. And so he took that to mean like skydiving and, you know, going on dates or whatever. And, you know, doing bungee jumping, the things that adults do that kids don't get to do that. That's how babies came. And so <laughs> the, the, the parent told, told the, the kid that in truth, which I guess my brother would have been lying to me. So I guess that's not really the, the right application. However, the parent tearing, telling the child that uh, babies come from adult things. Um, the parent was still telling the truth, but the child's perception of it was so limited that he didn't fully understand. And so because of that, um, because of that, that the child's view of the real truth is skewed because of his limited knowledge. And I feel like for us as Christians, as, as people, as humans, um, God can tell us some things and, uh, he's telling us the truth, but because of our limited knowledge, we view it with some skews. I think there's a lot of things that happen that way. Um, and so it becomes even more important for us to be in prayer and spending time with God and asking for him to, to, you know, reveal us the, what the real truth is, as far as like what he's saying, like to, to help us to understand what the real truth is, because the truth is truth. But, um, to, but to reveal to us what the truth really looks like for us. Um, I think that's important. And so we should have faith that ultimately God does know and that he is providing things for us, that he is guiding us, but that maybe our view of the truth may be a little skewed. So when hard things come and when hard times come, you know, we don't understand hard times the same way God does. We view hard times as just hard times that we just ask God to take us, take those hard things away from us. But he gets to view hard times and hard things and, and, you know, um, hardship as, as discipline and as, you know, a formative and he gets to, to see the bigger picture and we don't. And so we don't understand. So there is a level of trust of just trusting that God is writing things and he is, is revealing things in his own time. Um, and though as, and as 
as we believe that, then it becomes easier to believe that God really did love us and that Jesus really did die for you. It's not that Jesus died for everybody but you. You're not the exception. Jesus died for you. And so that because of that, we then as Christians need to repent and turn away from our sins um, so that we can walk more fully in understanding who Christ is. Um, it is important for us to to turn away from our sins. But anyway, um, I wanted to... Uh, I guess with that, I guess to finish that thought off, sorry, um, to finish that thought off, you know, we walking away from our sin is important because it kind of goes back to that truth and fully understanding the truth. And, and as we walk outside of our sin and, you know, over the years, I've gotten better and better at, at quote unquote, not sinning and knowing my own capacities of sinning. And I recognize the more that I walk through my sin and get to the point where I sin less, the, the better I can live honestly my i enjoy my life more the less i sin i know that sounds contrary because you know we view things as going out and getting trashed and doing these things and partying and all this that's the fun of life yeah but um the lack of hangover is pretty fun the next day too i can tell you that um there's an old lecrae call uh, lecrae song that um talks about that that uh if you're curious you can and you know me you can ask me what song i'm talking about but um Anyway, that didn't make a whole lot of sense, but you get what I'm saying. Um, and so to kind of finish this podcast off, I guess uh, I wanted to share a couple of things in news that's kind of current. Um, we've got Russia threatening to retaliate against Finland for joining NATO. Like um, as soon as Finland joined NATO, like we knew that was coming, right? Like nobody's surprised that Russia was like, oh, what the crap? You joined NATO. Now you're going to pay. Uh, the question is whether or not Russia actually wants to step into that. Um, because at the same time, we also have the, uh, bond that, um, I think it is Brazil, China, Russia, and now, um, Saudi Arabia and Afghanistan. Uh, one of those countries, I can't remember which one that's probably really offensive to you. If you live in the country, I apologize, but, um, they joined up to basically try to, uh, take everything off of the U S dollar or whatever. But the problem is that, uh, you know, when we even look at like NATO, um, NATO contains like 60% of the world's countries and world's population and like half of over half of the world's population. So like, um, at some point it's going to be a versus B, you know, when you join the other party, you're just, a versus B in that. And you can start to see how it could quickly turn into world war three in that. Um, there's also a, uh, a man who, um, he's an ex LGBT activist who's, uh, facing jail time after sharing his testimony of leaving behind his gay lifestyle to follow Jesus. Um, basically, uh, he came out and, and, uh, became a Christian and, and renounced his lifestyle. Uh, and he, as he said, and as he puts it, he decided to repent of his last, last lifestyle. And, uh, and now he's facing legal issues, um, in Malta. And, uh, that just kind of goes to show that in America here, if, if you're listening from America, you know, we have some of these freedoms where you can become a Christian. You can do all these things. You can change your, your status and you can change all of these things. Um, and you can do so freely, but other countries don't have that same right. If, if you're, uh, if you live in a strictly, uh, Islamic nation and you become a Christian, you're breaking the law. Um, whereas in America, you can go, you can become, um, you know, a Muslim Hindu, you can become a Christian, you can go back and forth, you can jump back and forth and you're not breaking any laws. Um, and so it's important to be praying for these people that, you know, are becoming Christians that are quote unquote breaking laws by doing so. Um, and then, uh, the last piece of news I had was, um, that, uh, Russia is, they've stopped sharing their missile test info with the U S and began opening drills. Um, again, like that doesn't seem like it should be a surprise. I'm actually surprised that they, continue to share it with us as long as they have. Um, but basically, uh, Putin suspended the start treaty, 
um, saying that that Russia can ac accept the inspections of its nuclear sites under the agreement and basically is saying that NATO has declared war on Moscow and Ukraine and all this other stuff. And like, bruh, that's, <laughs> that, that doesn't come as a surprise to me. Um, but, but yeah, things are ramping up in the world scene and, uh, hopefully, uh, they calm down sooner rather than later, I think it's important for us to pray for, for Russia, you know, because ultimately these citizens, the citizens of Russia aren't, they aren't our enemy. You know, uh, even Vladimir Putin is not our enemy. Um, and so I pray that, that he has a legit encounter with Jesus in the name of Jesus. I just ask that Putin, um, uh, praying Lord, uh, that, that Putin would have a, a an a radical experience with you that you would begin to give him dreams of who you really are and visions of who you really are that are set apart away from, um, from his, uh, public lifestyle and that he begins to walk in you privately and that that would, um, direct his decisions. Um, but anyway, so, uh, thank you for joining in again. I know this is just kind of a placate place placeholder podcast. Uh, I just wanted to get on here, update you guys and, uh, not keep you waiting for two weeks in order for me to post a new podcast since we didn't have service. So there won't be a sermon this week. Um, but, uh, I appreciate you listening. I pre appreciate you listening the whole time. And, uh, don't forget to like, and subscribe on the platforms you can and write a positive review on the platforms. You can write a positive review. It does help views. Um, ultimately based off what I can tell for podcasts that the more something is listened to, the more it shows up in, in, uh, um, search feeds is recommended that kind of stuff. And the higher rated something is the more likely it is to uh, go viral and to be shared a lot. And I can see that in random days, um, on sermons that aren't even very good. All of a sudden just see just giant spike of listens. Um, I think that comes from because people joined in to listen at the same time and happened to like it because, and then it showed up on a search engine or search site a little higher up. But anyway, thank you guys. Uh, God bless.